Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer, and I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Intervertebral Disc Disease, What You Need to Know, with Dr. Dan Semino, Senior Resident in AMC's Neurology Service. Dr. Daniel Semino earned his veterinary degree from Cornell University in 2018 and then came to the Animal Medical Center to complete a one-year general internship. He elected to stay at AMC to pursue a residency in neurology and neurosurgery and is now in the third year of his residency. Dr. Semino loves all aspects of veterinary neurology, but is especially interested in neurosurgery and newly minim new minimally invasive techniques to help in the treatment of neurosurgical diseases in companion animals. Um, and we are so grateful to have him here with us to lead tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Dan Semino. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I'm very excited about this, very excited to be able to chat to you. Um, you know, this is something, I'm going to start sharing my screen in a second, but this is something we, you know, deal with every day and it's really great to have a bunch of, you know, enthusiastic owners coming in here and, and, and wanting to find out more information. Um, so I'm going to get right to it and let me go in presenter mode here. Is this okay? Michelle, I think everything should be good. Okay, so title of the talk, uh, intervertebral disc disease, what you need to know. So I, I wanted to answer a lot of some of the most common questions I get from clients, um, you know, just about the disease process in general, treatments, all of that. So hopefully I, I got to a lot of, of kind of some of your questions throughout this. So just a quick overview. Um, this is one of the most common neuro neurologic emergencies that our ER department sees, that our neurology service sees. Um, but an interesting fact is that intervertebral disc disease uh, in dogs is actually not that common in the general population. So only about 2% of dogs are affected. And now keep in mind, this is talking about every breed of dog. If you then switch over to the more common uh, predisposed breeds, um, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, basically one in four dachshunds are gonna be affected by a slipped disc um, in their lifetime. And I, I will use the term slipped disc, herniated disc, intervertebral disc disease, disc degeneration. I view all of those interchangeably um, to, to talk about the same process. Uh, so the reason this is important is it's a potentially life altering, um, event. So, so you can have a dog who's running around happy, you know, no problems ever to a dog who is severely affected and you need to kind of change around your life the next day. So it's really important to be armed with the information about, you know, what it looks like, how to treat it and how to prevent it is really key. So first things first, I always go with anatomy. Um, I know this is going to bore some people, but it's super, super crucial to understanding this disease and what happens. So this is the skeletal structure of a dog. Uh, important things to note here are how many potential discs there are. So it's about 26 intervertebral discs that exist in the canine spine. Uh, and the, the feline spine as well, which we'll talk about. Um, the intervertebral discs, the next slide shows it a little bit better, but they act as shock absorbers. So if we have these bones here on the vertebrae, those bones encase and protect the spinal cord itself. So this is just a skeletal model. What you're not seeing is the soft tissues, the actual neural tissues that, do, that carry the message from the brain. So I always like to uh, equate it to a road. So you have your brain, which is your processing center, and then your spinal cord in your neck, your thorax, your lumbar region, and your sacral region carries that message from the brain to the limbs telling them to advance the limbs, telling them where they are in space. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind. 
um, as we go along. So here's a little bit more showing the soft tissues. So you can see that the brown structure itself is the spinal cord, and these little purple structures are the intervertebral discs. So you can see how they act as shock absorbers. So you don't want your bones rubbing against each other, causing callus, causing sclerosis, pain. So you want those intervertebral discs there. They're, they're a natural protecting system, so they, they do a lot of good in health. Um, the issue is their location and what happens when they quote unquote herniate or they rupture. So you can see that they live right below the spinal cord. Okay. So they're kind of encased in between the vertebrae, which are those bones. The spinal cord sits right in the middle of those bones and it's got nowhere to go. That's a bony, a bony uh, coffin, if you will, where it can't move around. So when a disc herniates into the canal where the spinal cord is, the spinal cord being the softer tissue gets smushed and there's a bunch of blood vessels in there as well. Um, and then you can see other important thing to note is the spinal nerves. They come out at the individual foramen. We call them foramen. That's the hole where the spinal nerve comes out so that it can then go down to the limbs or the muscles of the abdomen or the muscles of the intestine, whatever. Uh, but they come out there. Those can also be affected. So I'm a big sweets guy. Uh, so I always equate the intervertebral discs to food. So jelly donut is my favorite analogy. So the way they are made um, is like a jelly donut. So they have this nice doughy outside uh, and then they have a soft um, gelatinous jelly center. Uh, and really that function, the structure is what allows it to have function. So all of those forces, when your dog jumps, your dog goes upstairs, your dog twists really fast, those forces are dispersed equally among the disc, um, specifically through that jelly, that nice cushion in the center. The, the fatal error lies in where that jelly is located and what happens to that jelly over time. So over time, especially in our predisposed dogs, that jelly, instead of saying, staying nice and liquidy, uh, and fluid and able to be compressed without moving around, it actually starts to mineralize. It, it takes on a texture more like gritty sand that is, that's really dry with a little bit of water. And so it sticks to it and it can become kind of like a rock. So because the nucleus pulposus, which is the jelly, um, lies more towards the top of the donut, it has a higher likelihood of herniating or extruding out of the top of that, of the dough um, when there is a high impact activity. So when that happens, uh, there's two, excuse me, two types of injuries occur. And this is really important to understand when we talk more about prognosis and what dogs recover and, and what dogs don't. But the two types of injury are a concussive, meaning a bruise. When that nucleus pulposus herniates, when that jelly herniates, it comes out like a rocket. It comes out fast because usually what happens is your dog has jumped off a high surface or tripped on something and it comes shooting out and actually hits and smacks the spinal cord, causing a bruise to develop. So that's just like any other bruise. You get smacked or bruise forms, a little inflammation in the spinal cord. That's the concussive injury. The compressive injury is what we try to address with surgery, um, which is like we talked about, that cord's got nowhere to go, so it gets smushed. And that's because the bones don't have any give with them, and the, and the spinal cord itself is also tethered down via its nerve roots that come off of it. So here's a diagram of that happening. So the green in this picture is the nucleus pulposus, the jelly. The blue is the annulus fibrosis, which is the doughy outside, that's the term for it. So you can see how the jelly has rocketed out to the spinal cord above and caused a compression. This is, a, we'll see some MRIs later and you'll see how really compressed and severe that can get. This, this I would call a mild compression in this drawing. Um, so just a little bit more, uh, nitpicky, a little more, more specific with anatomy. You can see here on the top right are some pictures 
of an actual real life disc from a cadaver. Um, and you can see how the top of the donut is very thin and the jelly is more tailored towards the top of it. As the pictures go along from the middle to the right, you see that that jelly takes on less of a nice gelatinous feel to more of a gritty and it almost looks the same color as the fibrous, tough exterior of the donut as, as age goes along. Um, that point is just uh, further shown in the bottom pictures where the nucleus pulposus, which is labeled NP, uh, is, is more towards the top of the donut. So the annulus fibrosis, which I kind of skipped over a little bit, um, it's a fibrous, tough collagen. It has layers that overlap in different, uh, in different directions, um, and the top is thinner and weaker. Uh, the nucleus pulposus, we kind of covered this a little bit already. Jelly-like, it's made up of chondrocytes. It's replaced with chondrocytes, which are more tough tissues. Um, over time, gets that sand gritty-like uh, texture and it's more prone to go out the top of the intervertebral disc. Another little fun factoid too is that, and this is something I always talk to clients about, these discs have very, very poor blood supply, which is part of the reason we think that they degenerate over time. And whether dogs with the genetics to have degenerative discs um, have even worse is, is still up for debate or, or not, uh, not solved yet. But you can see in this picture, there's a nice blood supply to the bone that's here. But then once you get to the intervertebral disc, which is the blue structure, you got nothing. Nothing's going in there. So the, the only way that these discs receive uh, nutrients uh, and recycle toxins that go into them is actually through motion. So motion is very good for the discs. It's just about high impact activities is when they become prone to herniating or extruding. Um, and then the bottom picture shows that they're not fully innervated, uh, but it's, it is an interesting fact. And, and we always think of herniated discs as being painful processes for dogs, which it is a lot of the time. Um, but generally we think because there's some pressure on the nerves or the spinal cord itself. Um, but there is actually nervous, uh, associ nervous supply and sensation to the disc itself. So just the simple act of that disc herniating or rupturing at the top can actually be painful itself. They've done studies in dogs where um, there was a, a little bit of, they injected an antibiotic or something like that to see if they can heal a, a problem in the disc. And it actually, that caused uh, pain in those dogs, which is an interesting fact. So uh, enough with the anatomy. I hope I didn't cause anybody to fall asleep. Um, and on to the clinical presentation. So how do these dogs look when they're, when they're coming in? So clinical signs, this is an oversimplification, but they vary greatly. So it really depends on where you've had that disc herniation. Like I said before, there are 26 discs in the canine back and depending on which one herniates will determine what clinical signs you have. So if you think about the road analogy again, if you were to herniate a disc in your lumbar spine that was behind your forelimbs, the message only gets cut off once it's at that point. And so only the message to your hind limbs will be cut off. Your front limbs should be fine. If you cut off the message in your neck, you're going to cut off all four limbs. And so you'll have clinical signs to all four limbs. That's something we, we term tetraparesis, meaning four, uh, and paresis, meaning weakness. You can have monoparesis. Only one hind limb can be affected. You can have both hind limbs affected, all four. And then the severity of how they're affected can, can also uh, vary. Uh, and there's, there's grading systems for this. Uh, but it can be just pain. So dogs can be totally functional and they're not having any trouble holding themselves up or dragging their limbs or none awareness of their limbs with just pain. And then it can go into mild versions where they're just, hey, they knuckle their, their feet every now and again, or I notice that they cross over sometimes to complete paraplegia or tetraplegia, meaning they have no movement at all. They cannot move their limbs. And then they can also have a loss of sensation to the limbs as well, which we'll get to in the prognosis section. So 
various, this is something that I, I get a lot from clients um, very commonly. I can tell you candidly that I don't use these. We don't use these on our, on our, on our clinical sheets. It's not that they're wrong. We just, we just describe with words because we like to be a little bit more specific, but this is certainly something that you can, you will see commonly. And, and a lot of veterinary neurologists use it too. It's not wrong to use. It's just something that uh, at the AMC, we're not, we don't find it necessary. Uh, but basically what it is, is it's taking those different levels. So in the modified Frankel scoring system, which is by far the most common, uh, a normal dog is technically a grade five, a dog who has no movement in his hind limbs and, um, and no sensation, uh, will, will be a grade zero. This, uh, grading system from the, the Texas spinal cord injury score, uh, is a bit more complex. Uh, it, it, it's good in a way because you can be a little bit more nitpicky and you describe every single limb on a dog. Uh, but again, uh, we find that it doesn't necessarily help us treat them any better or necessarily follow them up any better, but it, it definitely has its place. And certainly the doctors over at Texas A&M love this. So I wanted to show you some videos of dogs in various stages of their, their weakness. Uh, so these are all dogs who have a problem more towards the middle of their back. Um, this first one actually has one towards the, the top portion of the thorax. But in this video, what I want you to take note of is look at the hind limbs. So this dog, when it moves its hind limbs, it, it has this over exaggerated advancement phase. See how long that dog steps? That's not a normal gait, but the dog's walking. It's a little hunched, little painful, and it doesn't drag the limbs still walking. So I, I would call this a mild paraparesis, a mild weakness of both limbs. This would not necessarily, based on its presentation, not necessarily dictate, you know, further diagnostics. We might say, hey, let's, let's just see if your dog can get any better, depending on, on how they present. This dog is more of a classic, hey, we're on the fence. This is getting pretty bad. Um, she can walk across the floor in a straight line, but as soon as she starts to move, boom. So as soon as she starts to try to change directions, she's down. She can't, she can't hold her weight up. So I would call this dog weakly ambulatory. So the way that we classify these always is, are they ambulatory or non-ambulatory? So weakly ambulatory to non-ambulatory uh, with very good movement. So when they're on the fence like that, we tend to, you know, at least just describe more so we can make a clinical decision on what we do with them. Then this is some, you know, one of the more classic emergent presentations. Um, you know, hey, my dog has been off for a day or two. And then today we woke up and, and this, is, this is how she was. Um, so you can see that, you know, she needs full support the entire time. And you can see those little limbs trying to move, uh, but it's pretty, pretty scant, right? You're like, I, I think they're moving. She might just be wiggling her hips. So that's a dog who is non-ambulatory um, with poor movement. And if she wasn't moving them at all, I would, I would classify her as paraplegic. And then the next step, once you get a dog who is paraplegic, meaning they can't move them at all, is then to say, do they, do they sense, do they feel their, their limbs? So most common question I get from owners is, you know, what, what do we do in the future? When's this an emergency? When do we have to rush in? When do we have to sit back and wait? So I would say that always, always, always rapid onset of severe signs. So if you had even that second dog the, that walked across our floor and then fell, if you had that and it was very sudden onset within a day or two, you should absolutely come in through the emergency service. If your dog is still walking and can turn and change directions and seems comfortable, but just a little off in the hind limbs, it's always worth getting checked up if, if you're nervous, absolutely. Um, there's no problem with that, but it, we very well might say, hey, okay, there's definitely a problem, but hey, go home, put your dog on some strict rest, and then let's see how they go. Um, 
if you have been resting your dog, so say we told you to rest your dog because they had very mild signs, and then those signs are getting worse despite you keeping up with very strict bed rest with them, we're going to want you to come in because that's going to be an indication that we need to do something sooner, and we don't want to wait too long on these. Um, as I said before, if, if a pet cannot hold themselves up, so if they're non-ambulatory, always, 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 always come in right away, right away. Time can be of the essence with this. Um, if it is truly a slip disc. And if you think your dog is extremely painful, absolutely come in. We need to get them on pain meds and make them comfortable. That's always, that's always first priority for me. It's a little bit wordy, I apologize. Um, but we talk about predisposed breeds. Um, I have four of the most common breeds we see at the Animal Medical Center on this, on this slide in the pictures. Um, I'm sure there's there's lots of lots of owners um, here that that own one of these pets breeds. Um, so so the overall term is something called chondrodystrophism. So our chondrodystrophic dogs is something you will see a lot online. It's it's short legs, long backs. It's a type of dwarfism um, that affects the genesis of of chondroid sites uh, cells. So dachshunds are your classic, classic, classic breed. Um, and what happens, what comes along with that gene um, is a gene that makes that jelly center degenerate earlier in life. So it, be, it takes on more of that sandy, firm texture earlier in life. And they've done studies in French bulldogs, which is probably the most common breed we see in Manhattan. Um, and, and they can have signs as early as one year which is like you've barely had the dog at that point and they're already having an issue. So uh, typically when we talk about other predisposed breeds, Shih Tzus, um, Beagles, Dachshunds, it's, it's about one and a half year. So if you have a four month old puppy, it's very unlikely to be a slip disc. Um, typically in those predisposed breeds, the peak incidence is from the ages of three to six. Uh, and that's because over time, that donut, that that firm doughy donut layer, the annulus, can actually thicken, um, but it has not thickened during those years. And the jelly center is so mineralized and firm that that's going to have more of a chance of coming out of that thinner top of the donut. So that's the reason why that's the peak incidence in other dogs who are non-chondrodystrophic. It tends to be a little bit older. This is not so for to read off all the all the breeds, but this is this is straight from um, the ACVIM, which is the Veterinary Neurology um, uh, Society. This is straight from their website on on all of the predisposed breeds on here. So you can tell there's there's definitely a lot of breeds and there's many 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 more types of of breeds of of dogs, and that's why I always say any dog, any age. I have seen. 14 year old, you know, Rottweiler with a slip disc. It, it does not matter. Any dog has the possibility of a slip disc. Uh, it's just that it's more common in these other breeds. And, and so we, it's always better to have a heightened information if you own one of these breeds. Um, this is another very common question I get. Um, is there a genetic test? Yes, there is. So, so UC Davis, Uni University of California Davis is a very good vet school. Um, and they, they discovered this gene um, called the CDDY, and there's another gene called the CDPA uh, that has been connected with uh, early onset of uh, disc degeneration. And it's great. I, I think this is really important stuff um, for the veterinary field. And I think this is, this is good to get done on your dog. But like before, I'm going to say any dog, any age. And I think that if you have a predisposed breed who tests negative, it does not mean that there is no way they can they can herniate a disc. This is just one singular gene. There's probably other genes that are also associated that they haven't found. But I think this is really important stuff. I, I think overall the place for this test will be for breeders, um, especially with those predisposed breeds, so that we can try to start weeding this out. Um, in the next line of, of the pets and hopefully prevent more of this happening. So again, important, but, um, and I think is great to get done, but I, you know, I don't think it's, it's everything. Um, 
and then this is my little plug for cats as well. I am a cat. I am a cat guy. Uh, these are my cats on the bottom. This is how they help me do work. Um, but there, there was so so. I intervertebral disc does 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 exist in cats. Uh, it is very uncommon in the veterinary field. So as you can see there, there's one study of of nearly thirteen thousand cats in Europe, and only thirty one of them presented with a slip disc. I would say that our department at the AMC, who is you know doing anywhere from ten to twenty uh, surgeries for a slip disc in a dog a month, so let's say ten to twenty a month, we get two cats a year, two to three cats a year, where we're we're doing a surgery for a cat. So it's it's pretty rare. Um, they found in that study that purebreds were more predisposed, and of those purebreds, it would be British short hairs or Persians. You know, interesting factoid. I it, it's tough to. You know, a lot of cats don't go on walks, and so it's a, it's tough to prevent this from happening in in cats. Um, but it's something to watch out for. Uh, the interesting fact is that while dogs, there's a herniated disc can be kind of anywhere in the neck, the 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 thorax towards the back or the lumbar. Cats tend to be more in the lumbar region. So signs that your cat may be having this issue are similar where they can be just pain to paralysis of the limbs but also additionally watch out for a limp tail so the one one um, you know we'll, we'll hear and and that can go along with tail pull injuries this is another very common injury of cats as well uh, but it can be simply that the the tail has gone limp and they're you know I, why is why is that happening my cat always has their tail up when they're balancing um, other signs of pain in cats, uh, or because this can be difficult as well, is that they're, they're hiding more, they're not eating, they're not grooming, and then they might be biting at uh, frequently at the base of their tail. So something to watch out for for your free cat owners. Um, so next, let's talk about how we diagnose this, right? This is, this is another uh, a hot topic of debate um, with a lot of people and, and vets in general. So x-rays, the most, by far the most common question we get, should we do an x-ray to see if, if they have intervertebral disc disease? I will tell you that we at the AMC recommend, if you have a four-year-old dachshund, very classic, it's disc disease until proven otherwise, we do not recommend an x-ray. Um, the reason for that is because <clears throat> x-rays only show mineralized tissues. They, they really, I mean, they, they can show intestine and they can show lungs, but not as with as good uh, clarity. And the spinal cord and the spinal nerves don't show up at all. So it really just looks at vertebrae. And then what you do see is because that jelly has mineralized, you see, oh, there's mineral there. This dog has disc disease. But many dogs, you could take any dachshund off the street, any French bulldog off the street, and they're going to have mineralized discs. It does not mean that their problem is because of a herniated disc. So to us, we feel that one, it's, it's unnecessary. And then two, do we want to take a dog who has a herniated disc and put them on an x-ray table on their side? When they don't want to be, potentially they're twisting their back, we recommend against it, um, at least in the acute setting, in the, in the setting when they're just becoming affected. Now, different story if you think, oh, you know, I, I think this dog might have a fracture, they got hit by a bike, they got hit by a car. Different story. If you, have, if you have a high suspicion of something else going on with the spinal column, go for it. I do not want to ever, you know, take away from that. But um, we, we tend to be pretty hesitant with an x-ray on here. So this is one I had, <laughs> I'll put my foot in my mouth. This is one I had recently where I was like, oh, I don't need why, you know, we don't need an x-ray. And, and, and we had one. So we looked at it and I said, uh, okay, maybe, you know, this is a dog who was, who was not walking great in its hind limbs, uh, bigger dog. Disc disease was certainly on our list, but hey, and, and we found... If you look here, and I don't know if my pointer is coming but up, but if you look here in the middle of the spinal column, there are these little clearings um, where you have a slightly darker area. That is the hole where the nerve root comes out. And then in one of them, we see this slightly grayer area, which correlates to mineral. So, hey, maybe there's disc in the vertebral column, which is this area right here. So I said, okay. 
maybe this is maybe that's the case and and it did actually pan out i'll show you the mri after but this is most scenarios in this dog it's got three or four places where the disc would be which is right around here on an x-ray that are mineralized and and you know they come here and they say hey your, your dog's walking a little funky it's it's we did an x-ray it's it's disc disease right and then what i didn't show you here is the rest of this dog's x-ray so this is a french bulldog so you can see how what an odd angle that spine makes, right? So that's a congenital vertebral malformation uh, of a French bulldog. And that is why that dog was walking abnormally, uh, but certainly you could get fooled, right? So you don't know which is which. We did an MRI on this dog to figure that out, but you could have looked at this and said, it's gotta be the disc. That malformation is, is, is incidental. So then we, the other big issue with x-rays is you don't have a cross section. So you're looking at something in, in one view, potentially two, but you don't know which side is affected. You don't know where you would go with your surgical approach if that's something you're looking to do. Um, so the next advanced technique is a CT scan, which I would say that we don't use typically at, at the AMC, but it's certainly a widely used uh, modality for imaging. And the best part about this is you get a little more visualization of your soft tissues and you get a cross-sectional image. So you can start to see, you know, what's affected and, and how your spinal cord looks. Uh, it does require anesthesia, um, as does an MRI, uh, but it, it certainly is good for those classic breeds who you're just trying to get them in and out to surgically plan. So you don't want to do an MRI, which, which takes a little bit longer. So that's generally what people use CT scan for uh, in terms of disc disease uh, is to go fast, basically get them under anesthesia, get them in the CT scan, get them into the OR, do the surgery. So you can see here, um, the spinal cord, you don't have great visualization of it, but you can see the vertebrae and you can see this little patch of white right here at this site. And then this, the image on the left is the cross section. So you have little patches of white on the right and the left. That's your disc that herniated. That's what you're going to go in and take out surgically. That's the location you're going to go to. So you get a lot of information from this, which is good. So moving on, MRI is our gold standard. That's what we use. Um, Every single time we've gotten a protocol on our MRI where it, it goes very quickly. So we prefer it. It gives you a ton more information. You can actually see the different tissues of the spinal cord themselves and see if there's an, a, a, a really large amount of inflammation, something that's going to change the prognosis for the pet. So we get a lot more information from this um, and see if you're dealing with a lot of blood that's in there or a lot of disc material. Um, I will tell you, and this is a common question, which I, I forgot to put on the PowerPoint, is that a lot of people want to do an MRI earlier on, and that's absolutely the right thought process, right? We want to verify the diagnosis. However, if your dog is in the acute setting of, of per paralysis or, per or paresis weakness, so if they're still walking, basically, and they're comfortable, and it's been two days, we are not going to recommend an MRI because of the anesthesia. The anesthesia actually relaxes the muscles of the spine and can lead to more disc herniation just simply by doing the test. And then I have had dogs wake up and be worse neurologically and then need a surgery. So we're, we're always going to try to avoid um, anything that's going to potentially make dogs worse and make them prove to us that they need surgery. Uh, so this is that x-ray I showed you before. So we got lucky with this one, um, but then look at the MRI correlate. So the, the image on the left is what we call a sagittal. Um, it's where you're slicing along the length of a dog. And so, and then the image on the right uh, is the cross-sectional. So it's like a bread loaf. And you can see this little green line on the screen on the left image correlates to the bread loaf slice on the right. So look at how much more information we got from this MRI. So that very same site where I saw the increased grayness in the canal is there is something there. There's that kind of black cannonball thing that is bending that spinal cord up. Uh, so the spinal cord is this gray tissue that's in the middle. And then you see this little black um, cannonball, as I described it before, that's pushing it up. And so the rest of this spinal cord looks okay. 
Uh, all right, and then you can also get information about the discs themselves. So the, a normal disc, uh, fluids on an MRI on this sequence will show up very bright. So things like fat that have a lot of fluid in them, the, the jelly center, which should have a lot of fluid, sh fluid shows up bright. Um, and so you can see the normal structure of an intervertebral disc. There's the black on the top and the bottom, which is that donut, that fiber. And then there's the bright jelly-like center. So these discs in this dog are all very normal, except those two right there that are just fully black. And then the one that is protruding into the um, spinal canal. So let me show you the video as we scroll through. Keep an eye on the spinal cord right in the middle this gray circle with the white circle around it. So look how compressed that spinal cord gets. You can't even see it. It's like a little crescent moon that has then been squished up at the top of the canal. And I can tell you this dog was walking around with this for three to four weeks. So it is astounding how much the spinal cord can compensate for a severe, severe compression like this. So as we work through, you then start to see you're now moving forward and you see the spinal cord return back to its normal position. So other things we can see on this are blood vessels. We can see the aorta. We can see the abdominal contents. We don't generally make any large diagnosis on the abdom abdomen, but we can always take a peek and make sure we're not missing anything in the dog as well. So you can see why we prefer this. Um, it just gives us so much more information regarding a disc herniation. So let's get to treatment, um, right? So two major categories, medical management, meaning strict rest and pain medications. And when I say strict rest, I mean very, very strict rest. So either in a crate or a baby gated area, pets can come out, be on your lap as long as you have a hand on them. But the last thing we want is your dog walking around on, you know, what I have is, is hardwood floors. They're slippery for a dog who's already having trouble holding themselves up. Um, slippery floors, tries to jump on the couch, herniates more disc, right? Because when that, when that bit of disc herniates, it has not healed. There's a hole in the top of the donut. And so that hole's still open for about four weeks, which is why we say four weeks. Uh, and then comes the surgical the surgical candidate. So generally we use a very black and white distinction here. Can your dog hold themselves up? If they can't, they're a surgical candidate uh, and they go and they get an MRI. Uh, other cases where we're recommending a surgery are, yes, your dog can still hold themselves up, but it's been a week and they're, or it's been two days and they're a hell of a lot worse and they've been strictly rested. So we use that strict rest as a diagnostic tool. What happened when we said, don't move around, don't, don't, get into any trouble. Did you get worse or did you stay the same or did you get better? Um, there are cases where we're, we're doing a surgery just to treat severe pain, but generally we're, we're going pretty, pretty far with pain medications before we get to that state. So the goals of surgery, if we think about that bruise, we, those two types of injury. So the bruise, the concussion that comes out, it smacks the spinal, spinal cord, you get a bruise, and then you have compression. Spinal cord is smushed like that MRI that we looked at. Uh, goal of surgery, I can't do anything about the bruise except try to get as much blood flow to it as possible. I can't take out the inflammation. I can't splash something on it that's going to make it better. Uh, so all I can do is remove that compression of the spinal cord. So that is what surgery is targeted at. Let's get the, all that material out um, and let's help the spinal cord heal as fast as possible. Um, there's another extra procedure we can do in there, which is called a fenestration, uh, where we can try to re retrieve the rest of the jelly out of those discs so that more does not herniate in the future. And we can do that at multiple layers of disc as well. So prognosis, this is, this is super, super, super important, right? So ultimately what it comes down to is, does your dog feel their toes? Okay. If a dog feels their toes and the way we're testing that, if a dog moves their, their legs, they automatically feel their toes. So we don't have to ever like pinch their toes or anything like that. Um, so prognosis is already great with them. If they do not feel, or if they do not move their limbs, then we, then we have to determine, do they feel those toes? So it sounds mean, but we're basically 
pinching down as hard as possible on one of their toes or their tail to see if they have a response. And we all feel terrible about it, but anytime they feel, we're super happy, right? Because because the the distinction is if your dog feels its toes and I can get to it surgically within 12 hours, its chances of recovery are 95%. That's about as good of a guarantee as I can give with anything. Really, really good chances. And to boot, say, hey, you know, this procedure is expensive. I just can't put them through. Or, hey, it's the third one. I don't want to put them through it again. They have a pretty good shot with just strict rest alone, just if they feel their toes. So about 50 to 70%, depending on the, depending on the, the paper that you read, basically. So things are looking really good if they can feel their toes. Um, and then there's only about a 1% chance of myelomalacia, which is a very scary thing, which we will talk about in a little bit. Uh, if they do not feel their toes, that makes things a lot worse. Certainly 50% is not 0%, but we tell, we tell people about a 50% chance of that they're going to recover with a surgery. If they don't feel their toes and they don't get surgery, it's, it's pretty bleak. It's pretty bleak. 5 to 10% is generous. Um, and it depends on how the dog's doing, but I've, you know, I've, I've seen stranger things. And so I, I always tell people, Hey, you know, if you, if you can't do the surgery, at least stick them in a box for six weeks and see how they look basically. So, um, the other thing that's scarier when they get to, to what we call deep pain absent is that, you know, their chances of this fatal disease process called myelomalacia are, are, are upped and actually pretty real. So myelomalacia. It's a scary term. You're going to read about it online a lot. Um, it's because you're always going to read about the scary things the most, right? So what this is, is that bruise. It, it's that bruise not healing on its own. It's that bruise taking off. It consumes the entire spinal cord and it goes up and it goes down from the point of injury and it becomes fatal because it gets to the centers that control breathing. So one of the biggest nerves that controls your diaphragm is in the spinal cord in your neck. It comes from the what we call the caudal cervical region and that's called the phrenic nerve. Once that is affected once that bruise has taken over the entire spinal cord and that spinal cord is not functioning properly, and then it gets there, pets actually pass away from this. And that's how they, that's how they pass away is, is through lack of breathing. Certainly when we see this, we're always, you know, we, we never want a pet to get to that, to that region. And unfortunately we're, we're a lot of times recommending, you know, a humane euthanasia before they get there because we never want a pet to, you know, pass away on their own from not being able to breathe. Um, it's not a, not a great way to go. Um, but again, scary. Uh, it, it's pretty rare if, if your dog has sensation and still pretty rare if they don't, but it, it's a real thing. And um, we can never predict it from how pets present to us. And, and the most common time that this happens is in the two to four days after the initial spinal cord injury. The reason I have a picture of toothpaste is because that's what the cord actually turns into. It turns into this liquefied blob that comes out if you if in surgery you can see it when it happens sometimes so away from that stuff sorry to stress anyone out um this is called a hemilaminectomy so this is the most common way we address that compression and you can see in this model here we're drilling a what we call a window um, into the spine to retrieve that compressive material that has herniated What's missing here is the spinal cord, right? But if you pictured that hole right in the middle, there would be a spinal cord there that would be being pushed up by some herniated disc material. So, and what's also not pictured is the muscle. So you do have to fold over the muscles and expose the bone first, and then you drill in and you take it out. So to me, a dog cannot escape four weeks of rest, regardless of whether they have surgery or not. And that's because this bone and all those ligaments and all those muscles takes four weeks to heal. I have a lot of owners say, well, the skin was healed after 10 days. So I took them off rest. And so that is irksome. <laughs> um, basically this, like, look at this bone, look at these ligaments, the, that takes four weeks to heal. Dogs absolutely need to be strictly rested after, after a surgery for four weeks minimum. Um, these are some other options, pediculectomy, mini hemilaminectomy, all varying methods people have used in the past. 
this technique is called a ventral slot. This is what we use for uh, herniated discs in the neck most commonly. So the hemilaminectomy was most common for the thoracolumbar uh, discs, so more in the middle of the back. Uh, the ventral slot is for cervical problems, neck problems, and you can see uh, in the, the picture labeled B, um, the big spine, the dorsal process at the top. Uh, so pets are actually put on their back for the surgery. And this little slot, this little window we create, that's a square, we go in from the bottom of the neck. So we push the trachea and the other vital organs out of the way. And then we do a little bit of drilling. And then we actually drill out the rest of the spinal disc and then can access it from that area. So another procedure we can do during these surgeries to prevent future disc ruptures is something called a fenestration. And so that's when we take other discs that are in the area that are healthy and we take out the jelly. Um, that is to prevent that jelly from ever herniating again. And it's an interesting fact because people actually used to just only do fenestrations. Um, they didn't do the hemilaminectomy to, to, to take out the disc material and they actually did okay. Dogs did okay. They had about a 70% chance of recovery, 75% chance of recovery, which ultimately, if you look at how dogs do with strict rest alone, they're kind of the same numbers. So my guess is that's why, um, but it, it is an interesting factoid. So it's a highly debated topic in veterinary neurology, how many to fenestrate, um, which ones you should fenestrate. We try to do this as much as we can to, to help dogs along and try to prevent them from needing a second surgery. So this is a picture of that. Um, the picture on the right is the disc itself. And you can see we cut a little window and we take out the jelly. And this is kind of what it looks like at surgery uh, when we're doing it. We're taking out that jelly, making sure it can't come out again. So recovery is another one. Uh, a thing I always tell owners, we kind of already, I already hammered that home, the, the very strict rest. I won't belabor that point. Uh, but very, very, very important is that your dog very rarely is going to walk out of the hospital. They stay here for about two days. The bruise that has formed in the spinal cord takes a while to heal. The, the, the nervous system is notorious for taking its time. It doesn't act fast. Uh, so don't expect, hey, you know, they had surgery last week. Why aren't they walking again? I, I, as long as they're not worse, I'm not going to be stressed about it. I, I tell owners that full recovery is about eight to 12 weeks. The majority of dogs will be walking on their own within a couple of weeks, but I don't get stressed about it at all. If they come back at their two week recheck and they're not walking because I've seen dogs take 16 weeks. I, I will say that the average time is, is probably somewhere between four and eight weeks though. Um, rehab, formal rehab, super, super important. I am a big advocate of it, but I generally don't like dogs to start it until about three weeks after the surgery. Um, there's definitely rehab exercises to do at home for the first few weeks, like range of motion and just getting dogs out and walking a little bit. Uh, but I don't want them kind of going too hard at the gym, so to say, um, in the two days after their surgery. So generally I'm recommending that owners make an appointment for about three weeks after. Um, and then for, you know, the in-between time, we're doing some gentle massage, making sure the limbs stay nice and loose and mobile. Um, pets who don't recover, right? So this is kind of, uh, this is not worst case scenario because worst case scenario to me is when a pet passes away from the problem, but these are pets who don't ever recover and they, they don't ever walk on their own again. So wheelchairs are great options for these pets. I think it's pet dependent. Um, you guys know your pets better than I do. And that's always what I say. If you, if you have a happy-go-lucky dog who could not care less that they can't move their back limbs, put it in a cart. That dog's going to do fine. Um, some dogs are miserable, right? But that's, that's the owners knowing their pets better than I. Uh, things to know with this is that dogs will have permanent urinary and fecal incontinence. Um, that is, I would say, relatively easy to manage, but is certainly another management aspect. So sometimes, you know, we need to help them urinate, um, which always sounds intimidating to owners, but you basically push on their tummy in the right spot. And then the, and then the pee comes out and you do it twice a day and you can do it outside. So it's easier to clean. And so a lot of dogs don't mind it, um, but they can have a higher incidence of urinary tract infection, 
um, urine scald. So that's when the urine sits on them too long. So you have to be pretty active about, you know, wiping them and clean, making sure they're clean and dry. And then dogs who are laying on their sides a lot will get pressure sores too. So they definitely need to be, you know, a little more at home nursing care basically. But again, a, a lot of dogs do fine with this. It certainly is never our hope um, that they're, they're one of those dogs, but it's a reality. And, and I think, you know, every dog is different. And so you kind of have to judge them based on that. And recurrence. Um, so you talked about second and third surgeries, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Um, I general term, I say, you know, depending on the study you read, it's five to 40%. I would say that the incidence of recurrence is about 15 to 20%, depending on the breed. It does not always mean they need a second surgery. And it does not always mean that they're not going to need a surgery. Say the first one was, Hey, you recover. Great. We rested him. So we're not going to rest him this time. They could need a surgery that second time. So it's a little bit unpredictable, um, but it does happen. And the, the issue and why it becomes a little more complicated if they need second and third surgeries is you can only take off so much of that bone before the spine becomes unstable. So sometimes you actually need to add in, um, you know, stabilization equipment and plates and things like that. There's this procedure, I'm running a little over, so I'll, I'll hurry up. Uh, there's this procedure called a percutaneous laser disc ablation, which people always ask me about. Uh, jury's out. Jury's out as far as I'm concerned. A, a lot of the people who do it, there's only like three facilities in the country that do it. They're big proponents. And I think it's a should be great if we can long-term figure out that it didn't have any negative consequences. But basically what they do is that fenestration where we can take out a few of the discs, they can actually go in via fluoroscopic guidance and just take out all the jelly from all the discs. So then, hey, this dog's never going to have a slip disc. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I'm still, I try to read as much as I can. Uh, but I, because like I said before, those discs are a, a thing you need in health. They're, they're important for, for not allowing your spine to have chronic arthritis and to be mobile. So I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's, it's definitely a, an area that's worth a lot of um, investigating. To me, lifestyle modification is absolutely key in preventing this from happening again. So prevention is key, prevention, prevention. Gotta keep these dogs lean and active, right? It's all about preventing high impact activities, jumping stairs, but still keeping them active. The best thing you can do to prevent your dog from having a herniated disc emergency is to take them on regular walks with a harness. Harness super important because a lot of these dogs are predisposed to having a disc hernia in their neck as well. So you take some of the pressure off their neck by, by using a harness and not a collar. Uh, the regular walks let the discs get blood flow. They keep the muscles strong so that your dog does jump. They have a lot less of a risk of herniating that disc. Super important prevention. And I think this is the last slide. So common disease, both dogs and cats, predisposition is your chondrogestophic breeds, um, short legs and long back. Uh, some pets have surgery. Some pets can just be strictly rested and do fine. Uh, how they, their neurologic grade and how they present dictates their prognosis, whether they feel their toes or not. Time is of the essence. So be on the lookout and never hesitate to get them seen by a vet. Uh, and then prevention is key. But I always, I always tell my owners, even a, even a bubble dog that you plastic wrap with the little the little packaging tape around it uh, can still slip a disc. So it, it's you can never be perfect. You just try to do the things you can to prevent as much as possible. And that is it. And this is my dog Poppy Seed uh, enjoying the glory of the sunbeam. Oh, so cute. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Samino. This was a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of questions, so Great. we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I guess this is a, just a basic a bulging disc versus ruptured disc. We had yeah. what's difference? Or that's that's a really good question and something I, I skipped over a little bit. But when we talk about disc disease, we talk about type one discs versus type two. Type one is more of your mm -hmm. rupture. We call it type one Hansen, uh, where a rup a rupture and the material oozes out and breaks out of its shell. A bulging disc is when that material has ruptured, but it gets encased in that donut layer annulus and it doesn't, it can't 
go front or back. And so I always equate that to like a big rock in the bottom of your shoe that just kind of sits there. And those can be a little bit more tricky to do surgery on and a little bit more tricky to, to treat. Um, so there's some different, different methods and, and, and ways of dealing with those. A lot of times we're more hands-off unless the dog is, is really, you know, showing that they need that dealt with. Okay, great. Um, we had a question two or three years post-surgery. How, for how long can you expect to see improvement? Um, that's a really good question. And I, and the answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> the, the answer is, is that I would say that generally the brunt of the improvement is with within the first three months. However, I have had pets that show continued improvement for about a year or two. I would say that two year past two years, they're, they're, they're probably going to be what they're going to be. Um, and, and there's, there's a doctor at, um, NC state, a very well-known veterinary neurologist, Dr. Olby, who actually thinks that those, what we call deep pain negative, the ones that don't feel their toes, she thinks a lot more of them regain the function to walk, but it takes a year. So, um, it, it up for debate, but it's a very good question. Okay. Um, is it typical for a dog to, um, sorry, I lost that, to regain, uh, movement more on one side than the other. Her dog is very weak on the left, but sturdy on the right. Yes. Yep. It, it's pretty much every single disc herniation has a lateralization. The, the interesting thing about it is that you would think, oh, well, the material came on the right. So the right's going to be worse. That's actually not the case all the time. Sometimes that material comes out so fast that it rockets the spinal cord into the bone. And so you have this, this, phenomenon where the actual say it came out on the right and the spinal cord hit the left side that bruise formed on the left side so that can be worse but very common i would say most pets have a lateralization where one leg is worse than the others and if they fully recover you generally don't notice but if they're like 95 percent better you might notice that oh that's their that's their gimpy leg okay okay yeah <laughs> um i also want to mention that we do have a video on uh, bladder expression, yeah. which we'll send to everyone tomorrow. Um, we had a question about if you have to pick your dog up to take them out for bladder expression, is there a way to handle them at that point that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I used to so I used to say pick them up like a baby sheep and then I had an owner look at me and like I've never picked them up I've never picked up a baby sheep like what are you talking about so I say like a like a bread loaf or at least just just two hands so you want one hand under their chest one hand under their pelvis and hug tight to you or you can even do one hand where you're like a bread loaf where you're kind of tucking it with one arm if your dog is small enough and your forearm is kind of supporting them. The idea is you're just keeping their spine parallel to the ground. What you do not want to do, which I do with my own pet, is you pick them up with the armpits and their legs are dangling mm. in, the, in, the, in the breeze, so to say. So you, you just want to be, just support them well. Okay, great. Um, if a dog is fine one year post-injury, good function, no, no surgery, how likely is recurrence? Yeah, it's recurrent I, general blanket term around 20%. Okay. Um, so it's always it's always a possibility, even if they've done great. The one thing I didn't mention is if your dog slipped a disc a year ago, that disc is highly, highly, highly unlikely to rupture again and be an issue. Usually it's one of the other discs that are most common. So um, that's that's why it's always a 20% chance. Because even if the L1, L2, the, the one between lumbar one and lumbar two herniated, your L3, L4 can herniate two months okay. later. Um, we have a, a dachshund breeder here regarding the genes and checking dogs for the gene. Has there been, have there been any studies that prove that having the gene makes dog more likely to have IVDD? Um, that I'm, I'm a little more, I mean, the study them's, the study themselves at UC Davis looked at that gene and the degeneration of the disc. So I, I think that's what the study actually showed. And one of the genes is interesting. One of the genes was actually just associated with shorter legs or longer back, but not disc degeneration. And one of them was with disc degeneration and shorter legs, longer back. So their whole goal of that study was like, hey, it's okay if they have this gene, but not the other gene. 
Um, and I think that, that I feel like, I think it was like the CPP, CPDA one is the gene that actually predisposed them to more herniation. But I don't, I don't know if anyone's put out a study outside of UC Davis. Okay. Okay. Um, do you see it more in mini dachshunds or thin dachshunds or? Um, <laughs> I would say, I would say more so not, we definitely have to do surgery on mini dachshunds, but it, they're less frequently. Less okay. frequently, we see it in, in many dachshunds as far as the general dachshund population. We don't get a whole lot. And it, it's also like take it with a grain of salt because it's, it's you vary based on where you're located. So Manhattan, I think we see, uh, we actually see a decent amount of mini dachshunds. So I might see mm-hmm. more than the, the practitioner in, in, you know, Michigan or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, it, just wondering, I, I know, obviously the our veterinarians are tuned to look for this. Is it missed a lot of profit by veterinarians across the country? Yeah, or? I think I think it's both it's missed and it's overdiagnosed. Okay, because a lot of times what happens is you get, hey, this dog is weak in its limbs and it's sudden onset and someone says, that's disc disease, go rest your dog, but it'll, but it, it, it won't be disc disease because it's, and I think this is a little bit where, and again, like veterinary neurologists are a little bit rare, like we're not everywhere, yeah. but we like, this is why I find it important. Like it's important to have a clinical suspicion, right? Like I have a 13 year old dog with a three month history of progressive hind limb weakness. It is unlikely to be a disc. Usually discs are pretty rapid in onset or they have a more waxing and waning onset. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We, we had several questions. I know people were asking acupuncture, um, yeah. which we do at, at yeah. AMC, people are wondering where they could get it. So yeah. uh, if you have any thoughts on that, laser therapy, acupuncture. Yeah. I think, of- I think a lot of those modalities are, are, are great. Um, generally I say they're no harm. I, I actually love acupuncture for, uh, dogs with disc disease. The only thing, the only caveat I say with those is, is know your dog, right? So I don't say I, we're in the four week strict rest period and your dog is an energetic bundle of, you know, fire. Don't go to acupuncture because they're going to be moving around. They're going to be twisting their back. Um, so I really like it for pets who are having spinal pain or you want to kind of manage them long term um, and try to do some prevention. So I, I find very good anecdotal uh, reports. I don't do it myself. So I, I don't have a more of a, a say in that. Uh, but I do I have a lot of owners who love it. Um, just as long as they're calm, and a lot of dogs just like totally relax during acupuncture too. And mm-hmm. so I think they love it. So I think it's it's great for a lot of pets, but not for every pet. Okay. Um, let's see, we have some questions just about playing tug of war. <laughs> Is that <laughs> bad for a dog? <laughs> tug of war? Yeah. That, yeah. That's like one of the most common ones I get. Uh, and that's the one where I haven't made up my mind yet because I know that some, like that is the only game some dogs like, like tug of war every night, tug of war. So, so yeah, tug of war. I think if your dog for thoracolumbar discs, less likely to be a problem just because there's kind of a, a dissipation of the pressures. But if your dog has any instance of neck pain at all, like that is, that's going to probably be an issue um, because I've had even just shaking their head when they're recovering from a slip disc in their neck can be a problem. So I, you know, I, I want, I always, and this is always what I say too, I want your dog to be a dog. I want your dog to be happy. Please do not put them in a bubble. Please let them be dogs. Right. So you, you do everything to a reasonable degree. If your dog needs to play tug of war to be a happy dog, then play tug of war, you know, and, and we can, we can try to work around it. But if it's kind of a, meh, they don't really like the game, then don't do it. What about um, running after the dog is recovered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Running Running is totally fine. Running is like, it is slightly higher impact. But again, this is that's something that's pretty safe. As long as you've gone through your strict rest period. And then there's always there's the other so I, I say there's two phases, there's the one month of strict rest. And then there's a second month where you're starting to work them back up to speed. They're an athlete who's been on bed rest for four weeks. Their muscles are jelly and soft. You need them to get stronger. You need them to get their lungs back. So don't go out running the day after rest. If you broke your arm and you got the cast off and the day you got the cast off, you played tennis, you'd break your arm again. So 
<laughs> so, so I, running is great. They can get back to running. Just don't like ease them back into it. Okay. Um, can a dog learn to walk again, but still not be able to express their bladder? Or to yes, urinate? absolutely. Yeah. That's a really good question. So that's, that's, there are, okay. So when a dog is DPA negative, there's a slightly higher incidence where they're going to have some urinary incontinence. It doesn't mean that they're fully incontinent. Like they're pouring urine out all the time. They might just dribble a little bit or commonly, uh, you know, oh, my dog, ever since they had the surgery, when they get excited, they now pee, like things like that. Uh, but there certainly are cases where they don't recover full bladder function. And that has to do with what portion of the spinal cord is affected. Okay. Um, let's see. Walking a dog with a collar. I know we, you said harness, harness, harness. Yeah, super important. Um, also a question about weight. Let's, yes, that's very important, super important. as well. Yep. Um, Okay, well, this was fantastic. By the way, Dr. Semino came right out of surgery down here, yeah, <laughs> running down. So we are so grateful for your time. Um, I know that the service is very busy um, and thank you again. Um, so thank you so much. Again, terrific presentation. We'll have it online tomorrow and send everyone a link. Uh, thank you to our education coordinator, Kimberly Young for helping us. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your continued interest and support of our program. So have a wonderful night and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.